<clears throat> All right. Are you guys ready to keep going yes. in this series, Eighth Day People? Well, you're awake today. I don't have to make any jokes about staying alive, staying awake. You guys are ready to go. Let's stand. We're in week three <clears throat> of this series, Eighth Day People. And we're going to be reading Ephesians chapter 1. Remember Ephesians 4 has kind of been our central passage here about taking off the old self and putting on the new self that's created in the likeness of God. Amazing. Amazing statement. But let's look at what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 starting in verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. Here it is, verse 10. He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Holy Spirit, come now. Oh, give us understanding today, Lord. Wake us up. Wake us up. Help our minds be clear. Teach us uh, this amazing truth that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> I love the book of Ephesians because there's just like these little lines in there that hold like everything you need and somehow like in church, we pass over them. Like you have a new self created in the likeness of God. That seems pretty important and profound, but something we just don't really hear. And here again in verse 10, we have another one. What was God's plan for the fullness of time? What was the fullness of God's plan? God's plan is to bring together, unite, sum up all things in heaven and earth in Jesus. Now, you need to step back. You'll be doing this in your small groups this week, so if you're not in a small group, get in one and do this exercise, because what I've, what I've asked you to do is step back and ask the question, what did you think God's plan was in Jesus? Did you think it was to get good people to heaven when they die? Did you think it was to make bad people better people? What did you think His plan was in Jesus? Because here it is. The plan is unite all things in heaven and earth in Christ. That's like pretty significant and something that's not really highlighted that much, at least in my experience with Christianity. This is the plan. Heaven and earth united in Him. See our graphic again. Eighth day people are the place through Christ where heaven and earth meet overlap. They become one because we are one with him. This whole series is about stepping in to the eighth day, which is about living as the new creation that you actually are, which is living as the, the place where heaven and earth meet, where they collide, recognizing that that has happened in Jesus, recognizing that that is the plan. That's what this whole series is about, actually stepping into that so you would live a life that makes Moses and Elijah say, wow. So that you would live a life that you would say, as a whole, my life is defined by the power and the presence and the love of God. Really, actually, tangibly. I hope that's what you all long for. Even if you feel like you don't have it yet, that's what you want. That's what this is about. And there are, uh, I would say, kind of three main buckets that hinder the modern Christian for that life. 
from that life. The, the first bucket is there's just some really uh, foundational things taught in the New Testament that we just haven't grasped. Like to experience God, you need a new self. You need a new life. Most of our Christianity is more, more like this. To go to heaven, you need to say a prayer. But the foundation of the New Testament is to experience God and have a relationship with Him. You need a new self, a new life. Jesus is very clear. You must be born again. So there's just some foundational things that we just aren't getting. The second bucket <clears throat> is there are some clear teachings of Jesus we just don't follow very well, like repent, believe the gospel. And if you were here last week, you learned repentance is defined by turning to God. And that's something that just defines the eighth day life. That defines the new creation life. I'm going to turn to God, turn from these things to God. And the reality is we just don't live a life that's full of turning, repentance. And so don't expect to have the fullness of the eighth day life when we're really not being taught or grasping just basic one-on-one principles of the New Testament and what Jesus taught when we're not really being discipled to follow really basic teaching, Jesus thought, like, turn from, as I put it last week, turn from the seventh day to the eighth day way. Turn from your old way to God. And the third bucket <clears throat> may be the most challenging one, and that is there are just some ways of thinking, uh, what we'd call worldviews, that are just totally foreign to the way the people in the Bible think about things. And that can be really difficult to overcome because a worldview, I mean, that is just given to you, you're indoctrinated in it, it's formed in you throughout the majority of your life, and you don't even a lot of times notice that you even have it because it's just so natural. And there are two main worldviews in our world today, and they are huge hindrances to stepping into the eighth day life. And everybody is going to fall into one of these two worldviews because that's what there is. That's the options for you. And the first worldview, are you guys ready today? Did you drink coffee? Because this is a note-taking day. We got to really dive into some stuff. I don't have a whole lot of time, so I got to get going. You got to listen fast right fast. We've got to get through this. This is an important message today, okay? So the first worldview that's very prominent, I'm going to move Cody's mic back a little bit because I'm going to start preaching at some point, and I might trip myself if I get too excited. The first <clears throat> important worldview that is everywhere, especially in the secular world, but it's, it's in the church some places as well, is called monism. Monism is this worldview that everything in existence, my little ball of clay here is all of existence, okay? Everything in existence is material or some kind of matter, particle, wave. Anything in existence can be explained through the sciences. You all are familiar with this worldview. There's only one plane of existence, and it can all be explained even the deepest things in our lives, like love, like our existence as human beings, it can all be explained through physical, chemical processes in the brain or whatever. This is monism. There's one plane of existence. It's the material. And that's very prevalent, <clears throat> or it has been very prevalent for the last uh, several decades, especially in the West. Okay, okay. This is, everything can be explained as long as we have enough information, we study enough, we'll figure it all out on this plane of existence. That's monism. The second <clears throat> worldview that people fall into is called dualism. And dualism says there's two planes of existence. There's the material and the spiritual and this is going to be in pretty much every religion, including Christianity, every church. 
is dualism. There's material, there's spiritual. Two planes, two separate planes of existence, and it always ends up that the spiritual becomes elevated in dualism, and the material doesn't matter. Everybody in this room is going to fall into one of these worldviews. And then there's the biblical one. Some of you are saying, is it dualism the biblical one? If you already have a dualistic worldview, dualism is the biblical one. If you imprint your own worldview on it, dualism will look like the biblical one. If you let the Bible shape your worldview, you'll have a different worldview. Are you ready for it? Because here's the thing. In the Bible, two things can be one thing. And the fancy word for it nowadays is holistic dualism. I don't know that that totally gets the point across, but it's what we got now. But two things can be one thing in the biblical worldview. Heaven and earth united in Him. This is going to be a brain bender for you today. Literally, you're coming from a worldview that says one plus one is always two and going to one that says, well, sometimes one plus one is one. That's what we're talking about. Let me read you some scriptures with that in mind to see how this worldview kind of comes out. Genesis 1.27. I'm going to read this real slow, and I want you to pay attention. Are you ready? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Man and him are for sure in the singular in the Hebrew. He created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, how you all doing? You got blank stares on your face. How many images are there? One. But there's two, male and female. But there's one. But there's two. Do you see it? And here's the thing you're going to have to get your mind around. This is not 50% and 50%. This is fully the image, fully the image, but it's one image. If you are male in here, you are not half the image. You're fully the image because you're fully human. And if you're female, you're not half the image. You're fully the image because you're fully human. It's two whole, full images are one image. Some of you aren't nodding yet, so let me keep going. Genesis 2.24. This is where the Bible pulls this worldview from like the cosmic place because it's telling you, hey, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and that's one creation. This is one thing. And we're like, okay, my brain can't take that. So the Bible's like, let me, let me give it to you in a tangible way that your little peanut brain might be able to comprehend. Therefore... A man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife. They shall become one flesh. So the marriage picture is actually the tangible way that we can kind of start to try to wrap our mind around this worldview. Oh, two can be one. This is why Christian theology has always, to stay within orthodoxy, it's always been forced to say, Jesus is fully God and fully man. Even though that breaks our worldview, and it'd be a lot easier to say, he's 50% God, 50% man, and then they come together. Christianity has known, hey, we don't know how to explain this, and, and this isn't fitting with our worldview, but it's known that this is what it is. It's 
fully God, which is way different than a human, and it's fully man, which is way different than God, and they're one thing. How y'all doing? You got a little brain power left? We doing okay? This will change your life, I promise. You start to absorb this and just say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into this. I'm, gonna, I'm going to let this way of thinking shape my worldview. The reason the Bible has a worldview like this is because it deals with things that you can't quantify, like human existence, like love, like encountering a God. It's not talking about things where it's like, yeah, one plus one is two. It's explaining things that are so profound, so mysterious, but at the same time, very real. And so it, this is the pictures that it's painting. This is where that worldview comes from. We're dealing with deep, deep things in the universe. From that comes a worldview of, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. And one plus one can be one in the strange universe we live in. <clears throat> it brings us to this biblical concept of shalom, which is the Hebrew word that's usually translated peace, or I shouldn't say it's usually translated peace. I should say most of the times we recognize that it's translated peace. But what shalom means is complete, whole. The title of my message today is Total Integration, because that's kind of a modern way of saying what shalom is. You're fully one. Shalom. Let's, let me give you a few examples. Joshua chapter 8, 31. Joshua is getting ready to build an altar to the Lord, and it says this, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, you'll build the altar of uncut stones, shalom stones, stones that have no break in them. They're not cut. It's just a whole rock, shalom. Job writes in uh, Job chapter 5, he says, you'll know your house is in a state of shalom, translated, you know your house is in order, but you know your house is in a state of shalom when nothing's missing. All your belongings are there, your family's there, it's all whole, shalom. Jesus is called in Isaiah chapter 9, the prince of shalom, peace, and now you know why, because Paul says in Ephesians 1, the whole plan in Jesus is that heaven and earth would be united. He's the prince where the two are one. Do you get it? Yeah. A major city in the Bible is the city where the temple is, where heaven and earth meet. It is called Yerushalom, the city of peace, Jerusalem. And John, in the book of Revelation, makes it very clear, at the end, the whole of everything, creation, is going to be covered by the new Jerusalem, because heaven and earth come together in this picture of the person who's the prince of peace, of the city, that's the city of peace, shalom, wholeness. What I'm trying to show you is this is not just a little side topic in the Bible, this is the whole thing. This is the foundation of the whole worldview. Whole, oneness, shalom, two can be one. How are you all doing? Of course, Paul writes in Ephesians 2.14, for he himself, being Jesus, is our peace, who has made us both, what? One, of course, he has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. This is talking about the divisions in culture, in society, politics, whatever it is. It says, oh, in, in him who is peace, the two are now one. Paul writes in Galatians, we're all one in Christ. Now, if you put in a little bit of work to adjust your worldview that right now is probably either monism or dualism and step into the biblical worldview, it's going to change. You may be asking, well, what's that going to change? Well, I have, a, I have many, many thoughts. I'll give you a few of them. How's that? What does adopting 
the biblical worldview being shaped by the biblical worldview change. First, it will change your marriage. You can leave out of this place today with a whole different idea about your marriage than you came in with. Because our marriage today is usually defined, uh, you know, I hear people say this all the time, they're my other half. They're my better half. Well, we have to ask, is that, is that what the Bible is saying? That two halves make a whole or two wholes make a one? Most of your marriage books that I'm sure you're reading, and that's good, I'm glad you're working on your marriage, but a lot of them will talk about meeting each other's needs. You need to meet their need. They need to meet your need, your emotional need, your mental need. I need you to do this. That is a product of viewing everything in a separated, particulated way. I am not whole unless you fill in the gaps to make me whole. Did you know I do not need my wife? I don't need my wife. Did you know the Bible never says husbands need your wife? Wives need your husband. See, what biblical marriage is after is not two halves of a whole. It's after two. That's called uh, codependency, interdependency. The Bible is after two whole people who are one. And so I don't need my wife. I need to be whole so I am free to love my wife, to delight in my wife, to desire my wife, to enjoy my wife. That's what you're called to do. Doesn't that sound like a nice thing? Wouldn't you be, I love, wouldn't it be, you're free now. You're free to love your husband, to delight in your husband, to enjoy your husband. Because you now know, I don't need them. I'm supposed to love them and enjoy them, delight in them. And whatever they're doing doesn't change that because they're not making me whole. Did I tell you, you could change the dynamic of your marriage as you walk out the door today if you adopt the biblical worldview. It'll change your marriage. It'll change your relationship with work. Uh Uh-oh. Because all Americans are after this coveted thing called work-life balance. Again, so many books written about that, I'm sure. Work-life balance. I have good news for you today. That does not exist. (laughs) If you have experienced work-life balance, it is because you are on your way from one extreme to another. And everybody has done this. I'm devoted to my family. I'm putting it here. But now my career is suffering, so I'm on my way back. And oh, in the middle here, I have balance for like two days. And then I'm on my way. And now I'm devoted to my career. That's where you experience balance is as you're swinging between the two extremes of commitment to your career, commitment to your family, commitment to your career, commitment to your family, and in the middle, you'll have those two or three days of work-life balance that'll feel pretty good, and it'll add up to like 12 days of your whole life where you had a work-life balance. Anybody, anybody experience that? <clears throat> God's plan is not that you balance two separate things. His plan is integration. I remember one time I was in class. We had a guest teacher come in, and he had a collar on. Y'all know the priest clergy collar? Where I went to school, we didn't do the collar thing. I didn't even know what it was. It was weird that he came in with the priest collar. And he could tell that we all thought it was weird. And so he started the class. He said, you know why I wear this collar to class? He said, because the Lord showed me I don't stop being a pastor when I go to the classroom. And I don't stop being a pastor when I go home. And I don't stop being a pastor when I go to the restaurant. It's all integrated. That's part of who I am that's not to be separated, but whole. 
And so what if you looked at your work and you said, you know, the things that I'm doing at work, uh, if you're a teacher, what I'm teaching the kids. If you're a worker, what you're working on. You know what? I'm going to bring that and use that to teach my kids. Show them what good work ethic looks like. Show them what learning looks like. It's going to be part, not that you're dumping all of your work problems at home, because that's usually what happens, but no, you're taking part of who you are and integrating it to the whole. And when you go to work, you don't leave the family man at home. You're not a kind father and a hard taskmaster. You're one integrated whole. This will change the way you look at your work. I could probably do a whole series on both of those topics, couldn't I? Change your marriage. It will change your relationship with your work. But what we're focused on today is it's going to change the way you follow Jesus. We're coming up to fasting time where all the churches do the fast, and we're doing a fast. I'm all about fasting. And you will go watch some videos on fasting, teaching on fasting. I'm not teaching on fasting today. But uh, you will see uh, some of the strongest dualism that is in the church. We are de-emphasizing the physical to emphasize the spiritual. That's what fasting is. Well, not if you read the Bible, it's not. If you make up a definition for it, that's what it is. Read the Bible. There's about a little over 30 instances of fasting. And what is amazing in those is they have this uh, turning experience with God that sets them off in a different direction. Something amazing happens. God redirects their life, then they don't eat. What's that about? Fasting is not that you lower the physical to enhance the spiritual. Fasting is you embody what's happening in the spiritual. Do I need to say that again? Fasting is about embodying what's going on in the spiritual. It's about bringing that into your embodied experience because humans are embodied creatures. How y'all doing? Baptism. It's a physical act. But it's also a spiritual act. How does that work? Well, it doesn't work in dualism, but it works in the biblical worldview because what's going on with this isn't separate from what's going on in the spiritual. It's all to be one. And we are seeing the devastating effects of this worldview where it's all separated out in the church today because whether we like it or not, we have adopted this idea that, well, my walk with Jesus is all mental, it's prayer, it's spiritual, it's inside, and so ultimately what I do with my body doesn't really matter that much. And people wouldn't say that, but that is what happens always. The spiritual becomes all that matters, and what you do with your body doesn't matter. And so God always forgives me. My inside inner man spiritual is clean and pure and sanctified. So what I do with my body really doesn't matter. And so, you know, you go sleep around with a bunch of people like some leaders are doing. You drink way too much and mix it with all kinds of drugs. That's just a body thing. And this is the result of not understanding. No, that's a spiritual thing. Because your body is part of the deal. It's a spiritual thing. And the great hope of Christianity is the resurrection of the body. Bodily resurrection. Y'all should be nodding at that. It's a very important <laughs> Christianity 101 bodily resurrection because you're not a bunch of separate parts. You're one whole. Are you
Are you all taking notes? Okay. Here's, here's the thing. Thinking in this particulated way that we're all parted out has left us as the body of Christ with no understanding of what it means to be one with Christ. Now, we talk about it a lot. You're one with Christ. You're seated with Christ. But we don't, even, we don't know what we're talking about because our worldview has left us in a place where we don't even have a category. What are we talking about? One with Christ. Our new self is created in the, after the likeness of God, seated with Christ in heavenly places, one with Him. How does that even work? Can two be one? I'm getting close to the end, I think. So, but I want you to pay attention to this part because this is going to be another brain bender part. Okay? Are you ready? Sometimes it's helpful to look at the extremes to try to gain some understanding of what we're talking about. So here's my first <clears throat> kind of question for you. We're talking about multiple things being one, two being one. And we're t we've been talking about the new self. Self is defined as our experiences, our background, memories, project plans, likes, dislikes, our total makeup, our whole life narrative, all the spiritual processes that hold all that together, basically everything that makes you, you, can those, can, can that be united? So here's the first extreme to think about. Because we think of, well, myself, that's me, that's my body. We all know what our self is is, right? You're like, this is myself. This is how I experience the world. This is myself. Can there then be one body with more than one self? You ever thought of that? This is how we experience the world. Uh, this is my body. It's myself. It's just me. I'm like in my own inner world. But here's the extreme question. Is there such a thing as one body with more than one self. Well, the Bible is going to talk about, well, a man <clears throat> uh, who's infested with a lot of spirits, about 70 of them called legion. So there's something kind of like there's one body but many spirits. Jesus says, hey, if you cast a spirit out of someone, it will go and wander the desert and bring seven back to the body. That's kind of the biblical category that might be like, well, yeah, I guess there's some kind of something going on there with one body and a lot of self, personality, whatever, identity. Well, in our modern world, let's look at it from another angle, we know that in extreme conditions, if someone is traumatized enough, if their self is battered enough, it can split. It's called disassociative identity disorder right now. I'm sure that will change. But it's pretty interesting. In one body, there are many, there can be many selves who have totally different history, background, and experiences to the original self. How y'all doing? These are extremes. Is there a category for one body, yet more than one self? Now, I'm not trying to comment on whether dissociated identity disorder is demonic and all that type of stuff. I'm just trying to give you, show you there's a biblical category. There's a modern understanding. When we ask the question, can there be one body and more than one self? I think the answer is sure. Seems like there's a category for that. That experience is the total opposite of shalom. You see that? Split, broken apart. So the next question is then, okay, can there be one self that operates in more than one body? 
total opposite. One self, more than one body. Well, again, in the modern kind of more natural world, you can read about uh, the Chaplin twins. They were identical twins who dressed the same, lived together, experienced their entire life together, and so they would talk at the same time in the same way. They would walk and move in the same time in the same way, and they would tell you we're one person in two bodies because they were so close. They were one. An uh, actor was asked while he was working on the Coen Brothers, a Coen Brothers movie. You all know the Coen Brothers? You all seen any of their movies? True Grit. That's your homework for this week. Go home, watch True Grit, great Western movie. The remake is the one they worked on. An actor that worked with the Coen Brothers was asked, what's it like to work with two directors? He said, oh, no, there's only one director. There's two bodies. So what does it mean then? What might it mean? You're one with Christ. That you share his experiences, his memories. See, here's the thing. In a lot of ministries, I've seen this going on. If this has helped you, I'm glad God helped you. God uses all kinds of things to help people. And so bless you for being helped. I'm all about helping people. But in ministries, I see this going on where they ask people, hey, go to this memory that you have that was traumatic and hard and imagine Jesus there with you. What does Jesus say to you? Bring Jesus into your memory. And I could say a lot about that. It's called guided imagery. <laughs> you can do it with anything. It doesn't have to be Jesus. Psychologists have known about this for a long time. But here is my question. Is it that Jesus is one with me? and that he's coming to my memory, or when we're talking about one with Christ, joining our self in the new self, is it that I'm one with him? And that brings the question, should I be experiencing his memories? Well, how do you do that? They wrote down what Jesus experienced, his memory, literally, the events, not just so you get information about it, but so that you're there. Do you get it? This changed the way you interact with the Word. When I read about the pool of Bethesda and the healing there, it's not just a cool story. I'm supposed to be with him. This is something that happened in his life an experience, a memory part of his self. And my new self is one with his self. Are you getting it? Is this helping you? It's through this close lived life that says, I've, I've been there with him through the word and the spirit moving through the word. I'm with him at the pool. I'm with him at the wedding of Cana. And Paul says, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with him. Are you getting it? I don't live, it's Christ that lives. But this is where it comes from. This idea of self, everything you are, with Him. So it'll change the way you interact with the Word. It's going to change the way you pray. See, prayer is just turning your heart to God. It's closeness with him. It's walking through life with him, just like those twins, just like in marriage. You are so close. This is just the, the Christian kind of buzzword, intimacy. We're so close, we're one. 
we've experienced all the same things. I know his likes, his dislikes, they're the same as mine. I know what he's going to say. We speak at the same time because I've been through all of this with Jesus. The two are one. And so when I'm praying, I'm turning to him, and we are experiencing life together now. And some of you have to get this because uh, prayer is not talking. It's turning your heart to God. Did you all get that? I've said before, God told me early on when we planted this church, however long you prepare for the sermon, you pray that same amount of time. And I've pretty much, I, I'm sure I've missed it here and there, but pretty much been faithful to that. If I prepare 20, 30 hours a week, I am praying 20 to 30 hours a week. And some of you are like, how in the world do you do that? What do you say all that time? Not much. <laughs> the deeper the prayer and the deeper the conflict in prayer the less words. I'll say that one more time. The deeper you are in prayer and the deeper conflict you are in in your life, less words. Because when you're in those moments that are really trying and difficult, prayer is I'm turning to the face of God. He's with me. I'm with Him. And a lot of times, all I say, Lord, help me. I don't need to say a whole lot. I don't need the most elaborate prayer because that's not what it's about. I'm with him. Lord, help me. Lord, guide me. Lord, show me. This is prayer uh, from the position of I'm one with him. He's with me. I'm with him. Shalom. We're one. All of this worship team, you guys can head up <clears throat> if you're around here. I just want to close with this. I know I've given you a lot of content to chew on, and that is what you're supposed to do, by the way. You need to chew on this like I said, I have many, many thoughts of how this applies to your life. I've given you like three or four. It applies to every area of your life. It applies to every area of your thinking. It is the way, uh, I'll, I'll say this, I think this is one of the greatest hindrances we have to truly stepping into the eighth day, is we are taking our eight and we're breaking heaven and earth apart when they're supposed to be coming together. And so we need to take this and chew on it and say, Lord, help me to implement this because this is hard because I'm going from a worldview that says one plus one is always two to one that says, well, one plus one is sometimes one. And, and we've got to get that. But I just want to say this, what holds this all together? What is it that can connect, integrate two very different separate things? And it is all by this word. In Hebrew, it's hesed. In Greek, it's typically agape. It's this amazing love of God that bonds the things that were separated and makes them one. And so I don't want you to leave here thinking you need to do a whole lot of mental gymnastics, though I think it's important we think on things. I don't want you to leave here thinking, you know, there's something I really have to, to do. All we're asked to do is be transformed, renew your mind, and trust the love of God can bring all of it together. The love of God can make you a whole person. The love of God can take your marriage and bring the two holes to one. And the love of God is how we have Jesus seated in heaven, yet I'm actually seated there with him, even though I'm not, I'm on earth 
right? Or am I? No. Two separate, distinct are one. And so would you stand today? We're just going to sing this song. I want you to just take some time to reflect. We're going to sing this song, Abba, which is this intimate word. Remember, intimacy, love is how this all comes together. And so we have to have these intimate moments with our Father God so that we grow in becoming one with Him.